This podcast is brought to you by Amicus Attorney, developers of legal practice management software. Let Amicus help you run your practice so you can focus on what you do best, practice law. Visit amicusattorney.com and get started today. There's been a significant amount of legal news recently about law firm mergers, as well as practice groups deciding to go elsewhere. And sometimes these developments aren't easy for partners changing firms or getting new management. I'm Stephanie Francis Ford, and on today's episode of the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered, I'm speaking with Karen Kaplowitz, a former law firm partner who now has a business development strategy group, and her specialties include lateral and post-merger integration. Welcome to the show, Karen. Thank you, Stephanie. You've written about what you term as lateral fatigue. Can you explain what that is for our listeners? Yes. One of my specialties, as you mentioned, is working with lateral partners to help them transition successfully when they make a move or after a merger. And what I started to observe is a lot of pushback from clients about their outside lawyers making moves. And I wrote a piece on the subject of what I called lateral fatigue in 2014. And what that refers to is the fact that clients are getting much less tolerant of the disruptions and the costs and the difficulties to them of their outside lawyers changing law firms. And that's an issue that has just mushroomed. So if you look, for example, at the Association of Corporate Counsel's value challenge, uh, you would find a piece specifically on this subject in 2017 by the former general counsel of Stanford University, Michael Roster, who asks a lot of very pointed questions about what's it going to cost for an outside lawyer to make a move? What's it going to cost the client? And so the bottom line is that lawyers and law firms cannot take for granted that their clients will be simply accepting of either mergers or lateral moves. I think that's fascinating because it seems like so frequently when you read about a law firm merger, you read about law firm mergers a lot um, in this year, and I'm probably going into next. I mean, it usually seems like the reason is to get more business and they can have like great cross practices. But you're saying that, you know, there's a fair amount of clients who are pushing back and saying, wait a minute. Absolutely. And what clients do when they're unhappy about a particular lateral, for example, making a move, they might not have a choice in the beginning about whether to continue with that lawyer. If the lawyer is in the middle of a transaction or the lawyer is in the middle of a lawsuit and it would not be easy to make a change, the client may go along with the fact that that lawyer is making a move. But what they do when they're not happy is they don't send new work Mm -hmm. or they uh, scrutinize the bills and they ask very pointed questions about, What's it going to cost? Are you going to cover the additional expense of there being a change of personnel, for example? Clients might also just be fairly resistant when a lateral says, I want you to meet some new lawyers at my new firm. Those are the kinds of signals and communications from clients that they are experiencing lateral fatigue and that they're just not that happy. You hear stories about a partner who wants to come into a new firm, makes promises about his or her business, and then he or she gets to the new place, and two years out, the numbers just aren't there. Do you think that, I mean, I think perhaps if you don't follow the law firm world, you just think, well, the lawyer inflated their numbers a bit, but collateral fatigue figure in as well is that they truly honestly do think they have this business and they go to the new place and it's not what it once was. Well, in in part, lateral fatigue may enter into it, but there are many other aspects of the fact that partners don't always end up bringing along as much business as they may have projected. Sometimes lawyers are blindsided, for example. They assume that their old law firms 
will accept the fact that they're walking out the door with a client. And they find increasingly that their old firms become very competitive. And the minute they hear that there's a move in the works, they mobilize and try to figure out how to hold on to the business. So lawyers can't just assume that they're going to be successful in bringing along client work. On the law firm side, law firms are fairly skeptical as well. One thing that I've observed is that when law firms are in the recruiting process, they're asking candidates to specify all the other lawyers in their old firm who worked on their client matters. And then they ask very pointed questions about whether those people are likely to be a problem in terms of moving the work. You know, in general, my advice to lawyers who are considering making a move is that they should under-promise and over-perform. You know, if they give lofty projections of the kind of work they're going to be able to generate and they don't come through, they're going to be in much worse shape than if they've under-promised and can point to a more successful performance in their first year or two. You know, the other thing that people might consider when they're talking to uh, prospective law firms, is a range. So instead of saying, I expect, you know, X millions of dollars, they give a range, which might result in their being paid less at the front end of a move, but ultimately might prevent their being sabotaged by overinflated numbers. You know, a big part of this issue also relates to the ethics rules. And I don't know if you'd like me to get into that at this point. Briefly, please. Okay. Well, so when partners are in a law firm, they have a fiduciary duty to hold the interests of their partners and of the law firm to a fiduciary standard. And depending on what state law applies, that might prohibit a partner in a law firm who's considering making a move from talking to a client about the fact that they're considering a move. So they can't expressly go to a client and say, I'm considering making a move and I'm considering X firm. If I make that move, will you let me take my business? So that poses an ethical and a practical dilemma for lawyers, many of whom do not adhere to the ethics rules and simply talk to their clients anyway because this is a pretty critical issue. You know, some people try to avoid the ethical issues by simply providing a prospective law firm employer with a list of clients and giving them authority at some point in the process to call those clients for, quote, references. So not asking specifically whether the work will move, but asking for a reference. And, you know, the clients get the picture and usually are forthcoming about whether that work is likely to follow the particular partner. I'm curious, and this is probably a dumb question, but all these things you're telling us about, I mean, it seems like it is is a risk to move. If someone is doing well at his or her firm, And another firm says, you know, come with us, we can give you a much bigger bonus. Maybe are there a fair amount of people that think, you know what, I'm going to stay because I'm doing okay. Maybe they would offer me more money, but who knows what would happen. And at the end of the day, I trust my colleagues. They trust me. We know each other. And I think it just makes more sense to stay at my shop as opposed to moving. Absolutely. You know, recruiters are making calls to partners in law firms virtually every day. And often they are not finding people with any interest in making a move. But in looking at the surge of lateral moves over the last decade, some of them are prompted by people looking for greener pastures who are not happy about what's happened in their law firms or how they've been treated in their law firms. 
you know, it's more rarely a situation in which the law firm just can't provide the support the partner needs for their clients. You know, mm-hmm. that that's more less frequently the reason. But many moves are also prompted by the fact that law firms have gotten uh, pickier about who they're keeping. You know, mm-hmm. it used to be you became a partner in a law firm and you were a partner for life. These days, if you are a 45-year-old partner and you do not control business, if you are a service partner, you may find at that age or older that your law firm doesn't have a place for you. So many lateral moves are ones that are initiated by law firms giving ultimatums to partners that it's time for them to move on. So you're right that in many cases people who are doing well stay put, but there are many people who are getting pushed out. Okay. Say if you're someone who is doing well and you have a high-profile practice and you're looking to go somewhere else and there's a bidding war and there's the client, you know, push and pull and your firm finds out, how can you avoid all that and get the best offer that's out there for you and remain in good graces and collegial with the firm you're leaving? Well, you've asked a couple of questions. So (laughs) with respect to the subject of how to leave gracefully Mm -hmm. from one firm and go to another, the most important rule, I believe, is to be client-centric and not be greedy in taking business or other lawyers. So the most important decision a lawyer has to make is whether to be really concerned about the client's interest first. That means, for example, that you don't take every last piece of work that you've been doing unless it's in the client's interest. You know, and the same is true for who the staffing is going to be. So, for example, if you're making a move and you've been working with a big team at your old firm, and you're not taking the entire team with you to a new firm, then the smart thing from both a relationship standpoint with the client and a relationship standpoint with your old law firm is to decide which of those people should continue regardless which firm they're in. So that to me is the number one rule. If you want to have a good relationship with your client and with your old law firm, don't be greedy. Another rule is don't talk down your old firm. You know, if you're looking to have a continued relationship with people you've been partners with and worked with for years, don't badmouth them. You know, you can be affirmative about why you're going to a new firm without talking ill of your old firm. Another practice that will endear any lateral to their old law firm is to send work to them, you know, to assure them that in appropriate circumstances, if they see an opportunity, they will, of course, refer work back to them. You know, those are some of the rules that I think make a great deal of sense, both from a client standpoint and from a law firm relationship standpoint. Well, that definitely makes sense. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to discuss how partners can get a good sense of what sort of work is valued and rewarded at their new firms. These days, law firms need to do more with less. Making this happen requires efficient, cost-effective tools that work the way you do. Available as a desktop or cloud solution, Amicus Attorney Practice Management Software improves the organization of your firm and drives your bottom line. Visit amicusattorney.com to discover how you can join the thousands of lawyers who rely on amicus every day to run their practices. And we're back. I'm Stephanie Francis Ward, and on today's episode of the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered, I'm speaking with Karen Kaplowitz about how partners can thrive when their firm is acquired in a merger or they make a lateral move to a new firm. So, Karen, If your firm gets acquired by another law firm, and they always say they're a merger, but you can kind of tell like who really has the power in those developments, what advice do you have for partners who have stayed from the old firm 
about figuring out the landscape at their new law firm and, you know, getting a good sense of what sort of work is valued and rewarded by people who make decisions on what your compensation is? That's a really important question. So the most important rule for lawyers in a merger situation or a lateral move is to try to integrate as quickly as possible. So when people make moves or there are mergers and the silos remain in place where lawyers who have joined a new firm just stick with their existing lawyer teams when they just work on their own client matters and they don't integrate into the new organization, that's a problem. So the most important rule is to try to have a plan for integration. The second way for people to move forward toward understanding what's important in the new firm is to understand the compensation system. You referred to compensation. The way firms compensate people is kind of the one of the most fundamental pieces of the culture of a new firm. So if there's one thing a lawyer joining a new organization needs to understand is how will they be compensated? How is origination credit uh, awarded? Who does it? Is there a system for reviewing it? Is there a system for appealing it? What's the culture of the place in terms of how compensation gets handled. What's the timetable? You know, people need to know, will there be a self-evaluation? When will there be reviews? The compensation system is the heart of what will explain culture in any new organization. The third thing I would say in terms of people joining new organizations is that they should figure out what committees are available. Is there a practice group? Are there industry practice groups? Are there other committees they can join? Are there events they can take advantage of? So again, becoming active and proactive in integration is a really critical strategy. And I would imagine maybe if someone isn't really excited or perhaps has anxiety about a merger, he or she may not push themselves as much to do some of these things that you mentioned, right? For sure. You know, people, I mean, people are very often bogged down, especially at the front end of a move or a merger in just transitioning their client matters and just figuring out, you know, where's the equipment? How does it work? Uh, you know, where's the lunchroom? I mean, there's a lot to learn mm-hmm. in a very short time at the front end of any move. So people sometimes remain fairly isolated. I see. Do you have specific tips on taking advantage of the cross-selling opportunities that it seems like are always mentioned when a law firm announces a merger, but then it also seems like when you read about lawsuits a few years down the road from specific partners, these cross-selling promises oftentimes are big points of contention once a firm merges, or a lateral comes to a a new shop. Do you have advice on that? Yes. My advice is to be realistic. So as you point out, the cross-selling opportunities, we've got a great new platform, is a hype that law firms recite on a regular basis. And those kinds of statements are often overblown. Cross-selling is very hard for people to do in an existing organization, let alone for somebody new to an organization, either through a merger or a lateral move. So people really need to be realistic about what their actual prospects are for opportunities to cross-sell. But if people really want to take advantage of new opportunities to sell their services to clients of a new firm, the best way to launch a cross-selling strategy is to offer cross-selling opportunities to other lawyers. 
So if somebody is interested in getting access to another partner's clients, the way to go about it is to go to that partner and say, I have a client you may be interested in because that opens the door. So the strategy is one of reciprocity. Reciprocity is the single best strategy for developing cross-selling opportunities. And if you don't have anything to be reciprocal about and you're expecting to just be on the receiving end of cross-selling opportunities, then that may not be a very realistic place to be. Okay. What advice do you have for service partners whose law firms merge? I mean, I would imagine that there's some law firms that they have no interest in service partners and maybe others do, but it's not, it doesn't play out the same way it did with the service partner's old firm. That's a really important question. For service partners, when they're making a move, they are, of course, continuously dependent on the rainmaker they're following. So they need to act in tandem with the rainmaker. They need to make sure, for example, that the rainmaker with whom they're working is comfortable with their doing work for other partners. It's a good thing for a service partner to broaden the number of people with whom they're working and from whom they're getting work, but they need to make sure that the person on whom they've been dependent is comfortable with that. And it might not happen in the first 30 days as people are really scurrying to transition. But after that, it's important for service partners to try to, again, integrate into the new firm. The other thing is that when a service partner gets to a new firm that highly values business development and rainmaking, it may not be too late for them to start generating business. They certainly should not rule that out because wherever they are, the old firm or the new firm, the currency is often business. So it's not too late to at least consider, do they have options in that area? Is there a business plan they can create? Do they have contacts they can exploit? The other thing is that it would be appropriate to at least consider whether the service partner can reasonably ask the rainmaker with whom they work to share credit for some of the work on which they both work. So in other words, if a service partner has been tied at the hip to a particular partner, a rainmaker, for the last five years, and that service partner is an integral part of the team that retains the confidence and work of the client, This is a perfect opportunity for the service partner to raise their hand and say to the rainmaker, is it appropriate for me to get some credit for this client? And, you know, if not now, when? This is an important juncture in anybody's career. And with delicacy, I mean, it's obviously not a situation in which a service partner is going to be confrontational, but it's certainly an issue that should be raised. If your law firm has merged and you feel like after a year, maybe two years out, it's just not working out, what are some honest questions to ask yourself when you're thinking about leaving? Well, the biggest issue is what are my options? And that comes down usually to the question of what client relationships do I control? So this is an issue that lawyers have to grapple with all the time, wherever they are in their careers. But if somebody's in a new firm, whether they've made a lateral move or it's a merger situation, there are certainly some signs that they want to be mindful of that might indicate that they need to consider whether they need to make another move. You know, so people need to watch for whether their work is slowing down. Are they finding that contrary to their expectations, the new firm is not bringing them into new matters? The new firm and new partners are not introducing them to new clients. And of course, The most dangerous sign of all is if a lawyer has joined a new firm, 
brought along some clients and has been generous in making introductions of their clients to the new firm. And they then see that partners at the new firm are moving in on their clients. They need to really pay attention to those signs. So if somebody's made a move and has a client relationship and explains to new partners to whom they've made introductions that they want to stay involved, they want to be kept informed, they want to be copied on email, they want to be invited to meetings, and they're not getting those kinds of courtesies and they're not getting that level of respect, that can be an indication that something is not working as it should. So that's just a warning sign. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like a very, very clear warning sign. Alternatively, are there some times when you work with partners at the new lateral firms and do you think sometimes that they need to check in with themselves and honestly assess whether they're being too rigid for any kind of positive change to happen with their new work situations? Well, I think that changing firms is very challenging. You know, the most important thing lawyers have when they've been in a firm for many years is a comfort level. They know how things work. They know who can do the work they need to get done for their clients. They have relationships in place. And when they make a move, it's pretty disruptive. And I think people need to understand that and give themselves some permission to be uncomfortable, but they also may need to get some help either from other partners in the firm, from staff in the firm, or from other people to be sure that they are making the kinds of accommodations they need to adjust to a new culture. I mean, lawyers can be rigid, but I think that more often they simply underestimate how hard it is to adjust to a new situation in which they don't have an entire cadre of people they know and trust. You know, that's what makes practicing law work well, is when you know and trust the people in whom you entrust work for your clients. And getting that in a new firm can take a while. And it sounds like with Well, what you mentioned, I mean, that's certainly, that's absolutely true. Also, if your firm has just been picked up in a merger, it sounds like it's a time to try and be kind to yourself, perhaps. Because as you said, there's so much going on and not to be too hard on yourself. I mean, do the best work you can and find these new connections, but don't beat yourself up over things because that's not going to help. Right. And the other thing I would tell people who've made a move, especially if they're a little uncomfortable is not to remind people at their new firm that the old firm did things differently. If there's one thing I hear from people all the time is that it gets very tiresome when new people keep saying, well, at my old firm, we did it this way, or at my old firm, this is the way it worked. So, you know, the adjustment process can be difficult, and people need to be nice to themselves, for sure, as you put it. But they also have to just give up the idea of making negative comparisons to their old firm. Right. Well, great advice. And I think that's everything I wanted to ask you today. Would you like to add anything else? You know, I think that um, the most important thing about the level of movement in the legal community is that law firms and lawyers have to invest as much in lateral and post-merger integration as they do in the initial recruitment or merger price. So in other words, what I see is that law firms acquire new talent or make significant investments in mergers and don't always make a comparable investment in the integration phase. And if there's one thing that I think would make a lot of things better for individuals and for law firms as a whole, 
it's evening out the investment between the initial acquisition or merger cost and the integration. Very good advice. Well, thanks again for joining us, Karen. I really appreciate it. And listeners, thank you for joining us today. If you like what you heard, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. And we'll see you next time at the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered.